Welcome back to another podcast episode of Veteran Oversight Now, the official podcast of the VA Office of Inspector General. I'm your host, Fred Baker. Each month, we'll bring you highlights of the VA OIG's recent oversight activities and interview key stakeholders in the office's critical work for veterans. Today, I'll be talking with Special Agent in Charge, Letitia Cleveland. Letitia leads the VA OIG's Office of Investigations, Healthcare Fraud Division. Welcome, Letitia. Thank you for having me, Fred. I'm excited to be a part of today's Veteran Oversight Now podcast. Great. Well, Letitia, tell the, uh, tell the listeners a little about who you are, where you came from, and just a little bit about your background. Well, I am a native of Wichita, Kansas, but I consider Texas my second home as I spent the majority of my life both in Dallas and in Houston. I actually attended college at Paul Quinn College here in Dallas, which is one of the uh, few HBCUs in the state of Texas. And I was first introduced to the OIG community um, at Paul Quinn College um, through an opportunity to participate in their internship program um, that was offered through another OIG, um, HHS OIG. Um, I was a criminal justice major, but initially had no aspirations to be a uh, law enforcement officer. Um, As a matter of fact, I had planned on attending law school and was pursuing that um, before I encountered the um, agents that visited my campus and were uh, looking for an intern. And I always had a vision of going back to school, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to be an agent and then going back. But here I am uh, 20 years later. a little bit over 20 years later, I won't say how many much over because then I'll be dating myself, but um, truly found uh, where I needed to be in the criminal justice uh, arena, Um, fell in love with the mission of the OIGs, the work we did, the people um, that we work with, the community that we served, and um, have truly uh, dedicated my entire career um, to that. Um, As working with HHS, HHS OIG is responsible for investigating fraud, waste, and abuse amongst um, all of the programs funded by HHS. Um, As you're probably aware, uh, Medicare is one of the most heavily funded, um, federally funded um, healthcare programs, and unfortunately, it's one of the most heavily defrauded. So the bulk of my career with HHS OIG was dedicated to investigating healthcare fraud or Medicare fraud. Um, And I was, as I mentioned, in Dallas and in Houston, but I was also fortunate to be stationed in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas for a bit and also spent some time at our headquarters um, and ultimately advanced to the role of assistant special agent in charge with HHS OIG, where I oversaw our investigative operations in all four judicial districts throughout the state of Texas. All right, Letitia, let's talk about you a little bit as a person. We'll get back to your, uh, your position in just a minute. Tell us a little bit about who you are and and what you like to do. Well, I am a military spouse and the mom to three children. Um, My husband is actually a naval reservist. Um, Together, we have two daughters. One is an avid athlete. She is playing volleyball, um, basketball, and anticipating uh, track in the spring and also in the school choir. So she's keeping us very busy, Um, but I'm glad to see her being able to do that, given that that wasn't the case on last year. Um, And my older daughter is a sophomore in high school and a very uh, accomplished violinist and excited about traveling with her orchestra for the first time since entering high school. Um, My bonus son is entering his last semester at UTA, um, studying information technology and looking forward to getting out there in the uh, workforce. Um, Outside of fighting crime, um, I truly enjoy the culinary arts as I'm an avid baker and dip treat maker. A what? What what was it? Maker, a, a baker and a what? Dipped treat maker. Dipped like treat. So like a cake pop or something? Cake pops, Oreos. Um, I make Oreo truffles, um, chocolate covered pretzels. Anything that might taste good with chocolate on it, I can do it. What is the craziest thing you, you've dipped? Um, I've, Maybe not to most, but I would say the cake pops because they were very challenging for me. Uh, Getting them to stay together and stay on the stick uh, was a little bit more daunting than I expected, but I've gotten pretty good with the Oreos and, oh, Cocoa Bombs. That's another uh, hot trend. I was able to master that over the winter break as well. Awesome. Awesome. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish up that. I just wanted to clarify what a a dip treat was. (laughs) Sure. No problem. Um, 
And I'll, I'll just add to that. Uh, jokingly, my brother-in-law calls me Betty Crocker with a gun. And uh, it's been an inside joke in our family for years. Everybody enjoys my desserts, but uh, thinks it's a little different that given uh, my line of work, that's what I like to do. But uh, it's a, a good hobby, but uh, can uh, add on some pounds if you're not careful. Sure, sure. So let's get back to the work you were doing in the HHS and, mm-hmm. and just kind of sum that up. And then how that led you to the VA OIG? Um, In my role with HHS OIG as a assistant special agent in charge, I really enjoyed developing investigative leads and doing that through a number of means, including um, proactive data analysis, which I hope we'll get to get into a little bit later um, in the podcast. Um, I also uh, provided training for the agents in the community that I served at large in regards to healthcare fraud schemes and and how to uh, investigate those for the agents and protect yourself against those for uh, the citizens. Um, all in efforts to uh, protect the healthcare benefits of our seniors, um, our disabled, and the indigent. Um, in my new role at the VA as the special agent in charge or SAC of the healthcare fraud division, um, it's allowing me to expand in those areas that I really enjoyed and uh, became very proficient in. Um, and it's allowing me to have a nationwide reach um, serving another very deserving population, um, our veterans and their family members benefit, family member beneficiaries. Sure. So you really, over time, become a, a, a healthcare fraud expert. I would say that. Sure. So tell us then, you're the head of this new special healthcare fraud division within the VAOIG. Never, we haven't had one of these before. Tell us a little bit about that, and, and talk about talk about why why we even needed that. Because if, if I'm correct, we have healthcare fraud agents spread out, but but this is who have experience. Uh, in healthcare fraud, uh, but but this division forms a, a more singular purpose. Sure, um, the VA actually operates the largest integrated healthcare system in the country, um, and through provisions under the Mission Act, um, we've recently expanded access for healthcare for our veterans by uh, contracting with community-based providers in recent years. Um, unfortunately. Um, That measure has made our program susceptible to fraud schemes um, that we commonly see with uh, similar structured programs like Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, from my experience, data is and will continue to be a driver for healthcare fraud investigations. Data analytics and modeling allow us to identify uh, fraud trends, outlier providers, and other aspects to uh, warrant further investigations. Um, The VA criminal investigators, as you mentioned, we have about 200 investigators across the country. They're experts at investigating fraud within the VA and most certainly within the complex and diverse healthcare system uh, that we have here at the VA. But my division is tasked with specifically supporting them. We're an investigative development division. And we do that by not only developing data-driven investigative leads, but by also providing investigative tools and resources, facilitating training, leveraging relationships with other VA divisions, and partnerships with other entities that have jurisdiction over healthcare fraud that's committed both against private and public players. So so when you say developing leads, data-driven development leads, correct me if I use the term wrong. What does that mean? What are you doing? Well, we're looking at known fraud indicators, um, Fred. We're analyzing our claims data and looking, um, a a good example would be outlier providers. And when I use that term, um, I mean providers that are billing outside of the normal patterns uh, for their uh, particular specialty or their uh, particular part of the country. We're looking for other types of indicators, such as uh, physicians that are billing for services with no prior uh, patient-provider relationships. Those are just some examples of uh, the types of data analytics we use to develop leads. Um, In addition to uh, relying on the data um, to show us um, fraud indicators, we also gather intelligence from our partners uh, within uh, the healthcare fraud community. Um, We're part of several uh, national healthcare fraud working groups. As a matter of fact, we created one of our own um, to partner with other um, agencies, as well as part of public and private um, healthcare anti-fraud associations, such as the National Healthcare Anti-Fraud Association and the Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership. 
um, by tapping into these organizations and uh, using data, data analytics and intelligence from our partners, we're able to strategically focus the VA's resources on uh, specific provider types, types of services, and geographic areas where we may have a higher vulnerability for health care fraud. So this information helps you draw, draw kind of a picture, per se, of where the OIG should focus its efforts with respect to health care fraud. Exactly. And we want to focus on not only what's occurring within uh, healthcare fraud right now, but what's emerging. So we use data to uh, to track that as well, coupled with intelligence. Is that what you were talking about? Uh, proactive? Yes. So so give, give me an example of what that means. Um, an example would be uh, receiving several complaints uh, in regards to our veteran beneficiaries being solicited for a particular type of service and then subsequently not receiving that service. Uh, we would use that information to analyze our data for that particular type of service and see where we have similar uh, claims uh, submission patterns. And then from there, we would uh, package that into an investigative lead and share that information with our uh, investigators in the field to actually uh, determine if it warrants further investigation. They're going to have the uh, boots on the ground, if you will, to be able to investigate uh, the leads. So let's talk emerging fraud trends. You know, is, mm -hmm. is, is this data, is this, you're using it to also to, to establish trends within the, the, the fraud community, for lack of a better word? Uh, and, and what do some of those look like? Um, some of the emerging fraud trends, um, as you could imagine, with us being in the pandemic and that limiting uh, a lot of in-person services, uh, one uh, primary example would be the emergence of telemedicine. Although that's something that we have uh, been using for quite a while here at the VA, especially with a lot of our veterans residing in more rural areas um, in recent years, um, that is a particular area where we know uh, we need to look at uh, fraud related to uh, telemedicine services, um, specifically in regards to upcoding for those services, making sure that what the providers are billing for, for example, if they say they're billing for a 30-minute service, that they're actually rendering 30 minutes worth of service and not a lesser uh, amount of time or service, um, and then subsequently uh, Solicitation through telemarketing is another area um, that's been a, an emerging trend. And then subsequent fraud schemes that stem from that, such as uh, individuals being solicited for medically unnecessary orthotic braces, uh, genetic tests, things of those nature. So knowing that those two uh, mechanisms, mechanisms are now in play in the healthcare arena, those are areas that we would need to look into as far as uh, emerging trends, fraud connected to those things. So before we talk about the makeup of the division, you said you mentioned a little bit earlier, I believe that, that data was kind of the future data. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's not only the future, but it's the present. It's allowing us to be strategic in our work. Um, we didn't have this uh, technology available to us uh, in the past. We uh, relied on uh, traditional law enforcement techniques, which are still very important and very applicable. But this is allowing us to focus our efforts and uh, use the data uh, to drive our, our efforts. So does this translate to uh, more bang for your buck? Yes, uh, by looking at the data and as I mentioned before, uh, identifying outlier providers, those are going to be the ones that are uh, billing more than the, their counterparts. That's going to allow us to uh, focus our efforts on those providers and potentially for those that maybe we have less exposure, look at alternative means uh, given our resources or maybe partner with our other law enforcement agencies so that we can uh, address the pot potential fraud activity amongst the providers. But it's certainly going to allow us to uh, focus our resources and make the best use of them. Because we simply can't, as, as an organization, chase every lead every time. Correct. But by using the data, it's going to allow us to focus our efforts and, as you put it, get more bang for our buck. More, more bang for the taxpayer buck. Correct. Correct. Great. So, Letitia, you wrote in an article, uh, you called this, uh, this new division a, a healthcare super, super group. What, what do you mean by that? And can you just talk a little bit about the, the makeup of the organization? 
Sure. Uh, the current makeup of the healthcare fraud division is myself. I also have an assistant special agent in charge, a senior special agent, and an investigative analyst, and uh, a chief investigative counsel. Uh, combined, we have over 30 years of experience investigating healthcare fraud among state and federally funded healthcare delivery programs. And we're in the process of adding additional members to our team, specifically to build up our data analytics team, as I've emphasized the importance of uh, the role data analytics plays in the work that we do. Um, we're planning to add a data scientist that will blend skills related to extracting data from the VA's data warehouse and data analysis, a nurse consultant um, that will be charged with reviewing claims histories and medical records, and also utilizing data analysis techniques with clinical knowledge to do to detect irregularities and fraud um, among services provided to our veterans and our family member beneficiaries. And um, once we're fully assembled, uh, that's what I have dubbed a healthcare fraud supergroup because we're, we'll be combining not only our years of experience, but our expertise in investigations, legal support, clinical experience, and advanced data analytics. That will be uh, a benefit not only to just the VA, but also to our healthcare fraud investigations community as a whole as we're partnering with these other agencies and organizations. Great. So so what makes it a super group? Is, is how unique is this among other agencies? Well, I can say from my uh, short tenure in this role, as you mentioned, we started back in August. I'm starting to learn that we are one of the few agencies that have a dedicated, uh, well, the only one that I'm aware of that have a data, dedicated healthcare fraud investigative development division. Um, some of the other agencies have a an individual um, in that role, but we are unique in that we have an entire division. And I think that's what's going to set us apart and help us to be uh, more impactful in that area. And it makes sense with us uh, operating the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. Great. And, and before we're going to move on to talk about some of these examples that we have of, of, of recent healthcare fraud cases that the VAOIG has uh, worked. Uh, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about collaboration with other agencies. What does that look like? And kind of kind of tell me, you know, are, are, you know, are we always the lead? Is sometimes somebody else the lead? And, and how does that help the veteran? Right. How does us working with Social Security Administration or HHS OIG how, how does that help the veteran? Mm -hmm. Well, from my experience as both a uh, field investigator and a supervisory investigator, it's always been advantageous to conduct joint investigations for a lot of the reasons we talked about. Uh, resources, for one. Um, the VA spends over $21 billion uh, on community-based uh, health care services alone. Uh, and that's what's estimated for uh, fiscal year 22, um, just to be clear. Um, as you can imagine, with only 200 agents um, across the country, that's a daunting task um, for us to uh, adequately monitor that um, and also to investigate um, allegations of, uh, of fraud within um, our programs. So by joining with other agencies, we're able to become a force multiplier, not only for our agency, but for uh, health care fraud for uh, federally funded programs as a whole. Um, we're part of the DOJ's National Healthcare Fraud Strike Force, uh, which was started back in 2007, um, dedicated to combining, um, similar to our group, data analytics with traditional law enforcement techniques uh, to take on uh, large-scale healthcare fraud schemes. Um, we are actually uh, partners with several of the other um, federal agencies that have the same focus, as you mentioned, uh, HHS OIG, also DCIS with the work that they do in preventing, detecting, and investigating fraud for TRICARE, um, the Office of Personnel Management OIG, Department of Labor, U.S. Postal Service, and of course, uh, the FBI, which has a healthcare fraud division. Um, as I mentioned, by doing that, uh, we're able to uh, split the load, if you will, and, and be more impactful in that area. Great. Great. Thank you, Letitia. So let's, we've got a couple uh, couple examples we want to uh, uh, talk about just just uh, briefly. Uh, uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is, you know, we're, we're talking about about fairly big money. Right. We're not talking about uh, necessarily tens of thousands of dollars. In September 2021, uh, there was a defendant who was in, indicted there in the northern district of Texas for conspiracy to commit health care fraud. Uh, it was one of uh, a joint. Uh, investigation uh, we did with uh, 
I believe it was, who was it? Uh, DOD? Um, yeah, uh, Department of Labor, Depart- uh, HHS, uh, and yeah, the Defense Criminal Investigation Services. But but there it was uh, $4 million for unnecessary laboratory testing. Can you tell me just a, just a little bit about that case and... and, and um, this case is an example of one of the emerging fraud schemes that we're facing within the healthcare fraud community, specifically in regard to unnecessary laboratory testing. Um, I mentioned uh, telemarketing and telemedicine. We're seeing that a lot of uh, beneficiaries um, are being solicited for unnecessary laboratory testing. Um, and in light of COVID-19, we're seeing that um, quite a bit. Uh, This particular case is a prime example of us working in joint partnership with other agencies that have a vested interest in protecting uh, healthcare benefits. As you mentioned, uh, DCIS, HHS, OIG, the FBI, OPM. In this particular case, Fred, we talked about the high volume of funds that are extended for healthcare programs. Uh, It was estimated at over $75 million uh, were at exposure for this particular case. Um, The loss to the VA... Um, was estimated at about $3 million for this particular case. Ooh, that's a lot of money. So, yes, it is. So, so another thing I'd like to point out with these, these uh, uh, fraud cases, they, they're, they're at all level of the organizations. Uh, we, we, we have another one in September 2021 where the founder and CEO and a CFO of a spinal uh, device company were arrested and indicted in the District of Massachusetts uh, for uh, on charges of violating the anti-kickback statute and conspiracy to violate it and conspiracy to commit money laundering, uh, it was another a joint another joint uh, 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 investigation. And if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, basically they uh, defendants paid millions of dollars to kickbacks to these surgeons uh, in exchange for the use of their surgical product products. This one in particular, I believe, involved six surgeons. Uh, and, and four of those were at the VA Medical Center uh, in Bronx, New York. Can you can you talk, talk just a little bit about these types of cases and the impacts that they have on veterans? Yes. Unfortunately, um, I talked about a lot of fraud schemes, but I failed to mention kickbacks. Uh, kickbacks are a persistent um, fraud scheme that we see within the um, healthcare care um, community, unfortunately, be that uh, payments to beneficiaries to receive services, um, payment to physicians to prescribe services or payment to different entities to use uh, specific devices like is, is the case in this particular um, uh, investigation that we're discussing. Um, unfortunately, when we have the engagement of kickbacks, it ultimately re- results in unnecessary services because I don't know about you, but um, I don't typically need to be paid to receive health care, nor does my physician need to be paid to prescribe it when I need it. And so when you introduce that into a to the delivery of health care programs, we oftentimes end up with uh, criminal and civil investigations that um, ensue, just like the case um, we're discussing here. Letitia, you know, with VA healthcare funding at an all-time high, I'm I'm sure that it brings out bad actors and, and novel opportunities for them to 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 figure out how to uh, uh, to 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 steal taxpayer dollars and 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 basically deprive veterans of the services they deserve. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to discuss surrounding this healthcare fraud division? Well, I just like to end by. Uh sharing with the veterans that the VA OIG has identified combating healthcare fraud as one of the highest priorities, hence the creation of my division back in um, August of 2021. Um, As the brand new special agent in charge for this division, it's my vision to make our division a one-stop shop in order to bolster the VA's efforts in healthcare fraud investigations. Thanks, Letitia. It certainly sounds like with the creation of this uh, healthcare healthcare fraud division that the VA OIG is is well-positioned and for the, the task at hand to uh, to help VA uh, ensure that its funds are spent uh, helping veterans and, and their family members as, as appropriate. We thank you for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you for having me. And now I'll turn it over to Adam Roy, who will give us the uh, monthly highlights. Take it, Adam. Thanks, Fred. Here's the December 2021 highlights. The VA OIG closed out 2021 with success, publishing 20 reports in December. 
Ongoing investigative work also continued, and I'll highlight a few cases now. Later, I'll briefly summarize several of our published reports. For information on all of VAOIG's activities in December, I encourage you to visit the website and click on our monthly highlights. Here we go. A VAOIG investigation revealed that from 2013 to 2021, a former purchasing agent for the VA community-based outpatient clinic in Fort McPherson, Georgia, used his government purchase card to make hundreds of unauthorized purchases of supplies. He then stole the supplies and resold them for profit. The defendant was sentenced in the Northern District of Georgia to 27 months imprisonment as well as 36 months supervised release in order to pay restitution of $2 million. Another healthcare investigation found that a former shuttle driver at the VA Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska, described to multiple VA medical officials a detailed plan to gather her weapons, including an Uzi and an AR-15 rifle, and drive to the facility to shoot and kill two co-workers and her supervisor. The defendant, who was detained for 14 months prior to sentencing, previously pleaded guilty to influencing, impeding, or retaliating against a federal official by threats. The defendant was sentenced in the District of Nebraska to 12 months imprisonment and three years supervised release with conditions related to mental health treatment, substance abuse, and restricted weapons possession. A VA OIG benefits investigation resulted in charges alleging that a veteran fraudulently led VA to believe he was blind. The defendant had been receiving 100% service-connected disability benefits since July 2011. It is alleged that the defendant falsely stated to VA during a recorded phone call that he was unable to drive himself. The defendant also stated that he had someone drive for him and that he had last drove approximately three blocks during daytime a few months prior to his conversation with investigators. It is further alleged that the defendant possessed a valid driver's license with a motorcycle endorsement and drove on a routine basis. The defendant was found guilty in the Middle District of Florida on charges of theft of government property and false statements. The loss to VA is nearly $430,000. In another benefits-related investigation, charges alleged that from March 2009 to February 2020, a defendant used VA and Social Security Administration benefit funds intended for the care of elderly, mentally ill, disabled, and veteran beneficiaries for her own personal use. The defendant was arrested after being indicted in the District of Columbia on charges of mail fraud, wire fraud, theft of government property, aggravated identity theft, representative payee fraud, making a false statement, tampering with documents, and first-degree theft. The defendant was charged with stealing more than $400,000 in government benefits from tenants of her rooming house. Of this amount, at least $170,000 was VA funds. VA OIG, Social Security Administration OIG, and Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program conducted the investigation. Another multi-agency investigation resulted in charges alleging that a former federal contractor obtained federal contracts while he was debarred. It is also alleged that the defendant posed as a federal contracting officer in order to negotiate fraudulent contracts with victim companies to complete work on contracts the defendant had been awarded. The defendant was linked to multiple companies and individuals that fraudulently obtained approximately $2.4 million in government contracts. Of this amount, approximately $800,000 was awarded by VA. The defendant pleaded guilty in the Eastern District of Washington to wire fraud and aggravated identity theft. The investigation was conducted by VA OIG, Defense Criminal Investigative Service, Army Criminal Investigation Command Major Procurement Fraud Unit, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, and OIGs from General Services Administration, Department of Justice, and Department of State. Now to publish reports. The VA OIG examined whether the Veterans Health Administration implemented systems to report on COVID-19 vaccine supply to VA medical facilities and doses administered to VA employees and veterans enrolled in VA's healthcare system. The OIG determined that facility-level vaccine supply data, which are manually entered, were not verified and vaccination data in key systems contained inaccuracies due to inadequate validation and user error. The team also found that some VHA staff initially lacked system access to enter employee vaccination data, and the VHA COVID-19 vaccine dashboard contained unvalidated data. Accurate data are needed to schedule COVID-19 vaccinations, report the percentages of vaccinated veterans and employees to the CDC, and help prevent COVID-19 vaccine theft. In the report, the OIG recommended verifying medical facility vaccine supply data, monitoring and minimizing data entry errors, and ensuring the dashboard data are reliable, accurate, and complete. 
Another VA OIG report deals with the Veterans Benefits Administration. VBA provides monthly benefits to veterans with disabilities caused by diseases or injuries incurred or aggravated during active military service. Special monthly compensation pays additional benefits, such as housebound entitlement for certain disabilities or a combination of disabilities. In September 2016, the OIG found that VBA incorrectly processed about 27% of high-risk housebound special monthly compensation cases. The OIG conducted a recent review to determine whether VBA implemented the OIG's 2016 recommendations. VBA continues to have the same estimated error rate, resulting in about $165 million in improper payments. Without improving oversight, accountability, and monitoring, VBA risks wasting taxpayer dollars and potentially subjecting veterans to repay overpayments. The OIG made six recommendations in the report. The OIG examined whether VA has an effective governance structure for ensuring deceased veterans' unclaimed remains are interred with dignity. The review was initiated after reports of deceased veterans' unclaimed remains being stored in a funeral home for decades. The review revealed significant deficiencies. VA had insufficient outreach to likely custodians of unclaimed veterans' remains and failed to fully engage entities with databases that could help locate them. In addition, the financial structure does not support cross-administration accounting, increasing the potential for fraud and duplicate benefit payments. No single office or executive was responsible for overseeing more than two dozen offices providing related benefits and services. As a result, VA does not have an accurate count of veterans whose remains are unclaimed. Remains that are unidentified could be placed in mass graves or stored for years unnoticed. The OIG made 11 recommendations to address the issues identified. The VA Mission Act of 2018 requires VA to conduct an inventory of its health care system's capacity, identify gaps in furnishing care to veterans, and make recommendations for modernizing or realigning VA facilities to fill those gaps. The OIG audited the accuracy of data measuring VA's specialty health care capacity. VHA will use the data to fulfill the requirements of the Mission Act. The audit examined the accuracy of three data components, workload, wait times, and provider clinical time allocations. The OIG concluded that only the workload data inaccuracies were significant enough to affect potential management decisions. VHA's reported fiscal year 2019 workload for 12 specialties across all VA care providers was found to be overstated by 10.7%, or about 563 full-time equivalent physician positions. This overstatement could result in the waste of taxpayer dollars and diminish access to care for some veterans. The OIG recommended that the Acting Undersecretary for Health perform additional analysis to ensure materially materially accurate data are used for implementing recommendations regarding facility modernization. During a healthcare inspection, the OIG assessed an allegation that the VA Southern Nevada Healthcare System in Las Vegas failed to diagnose and treat a patient's cancer. The OIG substantiated that providers failed to make a cancer diagnosis and treat the patient's cancer. Pulmonary staff did not follow up, and primary care providers did not ensure completion of annual lung cancer screening. Primary care providers did not follow up after a renal nodule had increased in size, and the patient did not have prostate cancer reoccurrent surveillance. One primary care provider delayed ordering an oncology consult copy and pasted documentation and did not document an assessment of the patient's lung nodules. Facility staff documented resolution of a family member's complaint despite not contacting the family. The OIG made five recommendations to the facility director related to lung cancer screening and follow-up care, abnormal radiology findings follow-up, patient surveillance after prostectomy, documentation, and complaint responses. The OIG conducts financial efficiency reviews to assess oversight and stewardship of funds at VA healthcare systems and to identify opportunities to achieve cost efficiencies. In one of the reports we published in December, the OIG assessed the oversight and stewardship of funds and identified opportunities for cost efficiency at the Eastern Oklahoma VA care system. The team focused on four areas. The system's review of open obligations for goods and services to determine whether they were still valid and necessary. The use of purchase cards, such as requirements for documenting transactions. The number of administrative staff compared to similar facilities and the accurate recording of labor costs. 
and four, efficiency in pharmacy operations, such as inventory management and the healthcare system's efforts to reduce costs. The OIG made nine recommendations for improving cost efficiency. The number of recommendations should not be used, however, to gauge the system's overall financial health. The intent is for system leaders to use these recommendations as a roadmap to improve financial operations in the areas reviewed. The OIG also published Comprehensive Healthcare Inspection Program, or CHIP, reports for Fayetteville VA Coastal Healthcare System in North Carolina and the Hampton VA Medical Center in Virginia. While the OIG selects and assesses specific areas of focus on a rotating basis each year for CHIP reports, the evaluation of VHA facility leadership performance and the effectiveness is an ongoing review topic. The results of facility leadership evaluations are published in CHIP summary reports. The CHIP summary reports published this month evaluated women's health care as well as leadership and organizational risks in VHA facilities in fiscal year 2020. Finally, we published two vet center inspection program reports that evaluated the quality of care delivered at vet centers. The first report focused on Continental District 4, Zone 1, and selected vet centers in Casper, Wyoming, Denver, Colorado, and El Paso in Midland, Texas. The second report focused on Pacific District 5, Zone 2, and selected vet centers in Fresno, High Desert, in Santa Cruz County in California, and in Honolulu, Hawaii. The inspections focused on six review areas, leadership and organizational risks, quality reviews, COVID-19 response, suicide prevention consultation, supervision and training, and environment of care. Well, that's it for December's highlights. Stay healthy, stay safe, and keep listening. Until next time. This has been an official podcast of the VA Office of Inspector General. Veteran Oversight Now is produced by the Office of Communications and Public Affairs and is available at va.gov forward slash OIG. Tune in monthly to hear how the VA OIG serves veterans, their families, and caregivers through meaningful, independent oversight. Check out the website for more on the VA OIG oversight mission. Read current reports and keep up to date on the latest criminal investigations. Report potential crimes related to VA, waste or mismanagement, potential violations of laws, rules, or regulations, or risks to patients, employees, or property to the OIG online. Or call the hotline at 1-800-488-8244. If you are a veteran in crisis or concerned about one, call the Veterans Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. Press 1 and speak with a qualified responder now.